the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Just sort of as a preamble to the sermon today, I want to, first of all, introduce you to two saints. St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco, and St. Tikon, confessor, patriarch uh, of Moscow. The reason I'm introducing these two is, first of all, this is the feast day, one of the feast days for him, when the Orthodox Church uh, glorified him and acknowledged him as a saint. The Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia had actually beat uh, the Russian Orthodox Church to uh, the de declaration of him as being a saint. Um, but at that point in time, on this date in 1989, I believe it was, um, he was, uh, his glorification was declared. Why do I mention St. John of Shanghai and him in the same uh, sentence? It's because of our relationship to those two saints. And uh, specifically, Father Sebastian's relationship to St. John of Shanghai and my relationship to St. Tikon. It wasn't direct. Father Sebastian's grandfather was an Anglican missionary in China back when St. John of Shanghai was there and met St. John of Shanghai. And I think to some extent, and perhaps to a large extent, two generations later, it ends up resulting, well, actually, yeah, two generations later in Father Sebastian's father becoming an Orthodox priest. Similarly, St. Tikhon, who probably is the most significant and perhaps the only uh, saint in the Orthodox Church who actually had a really profound effect on Canada specifically, having traveled across the country uh, and founding a number of churches, a lot of the churches in the rural area north of uh, Edmonton owe their foundation to St. Uh, Tikhon, who was a bishop over the church before it split into all of the different um, groupings. At the time that he was bishop here, there was no such thing as the Russian Orthodox Church and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. They were all under one bishop. And that unfortunate split <laughs> happens sometime after St. Tikhon actually dies. But this man, babysat my priest in Saskatoon, who was my spiritual father's mother. Well, his, her parents were doing the farm chores at a place called, near, on a farm near Kelmar, Kelmar uh, Alberta, a little south and a little west of Edmonton. We have a direct connection to the saint. This saint here was the one who established the, uh, and uh, incorporated the Orthodox Church in Canada as a uh, functional church. And after he had gone back to uh, Russia, having been summoned back to be a bishop in one of the churches there, was part of the great um, synod where the church was striving to deal with uh, errors in the church, and more specifically, things that were not of use in the church. It was also the synod at which the Church of Moscow, well, Russia, the Ruslands as it was at the time, reinstated the patriarchate that uh, St. Peter the Great had abolished, making the church a department of the government with the head of the church 
having to report to a superintendent of religion with their hands being somewhat tied and it was 190 years to the year from the moment that Saint, uh, Peter, or that Peter the Great, uh, from the time he abolished it to the time that the Patriarchate was reinstated and Tikhon was the first patriarch in modern times for all of the people that were in some connection or relationship to them. In 1920, Saint Tikhon gave autocephaly to the church in North America, oh, oh, sorry, autonomy to the Orthodox Church in North America and to all of the other churches that were part of the communion under Moscow that were outside of the Rus lands. They, he made them autonomous, not total independence, but he made them autonomous, gave them some protection. He also had sent out a note at one time saying, be careful, don't pay attention to anything that comes out of my office from here on in, because you do not know if I am doing this of my own free will, or if it's as a result of the intimidation and pressure that I am under. And he died eventually uh, while he was in, I think, it, I don't think he was in prison, but he was under house arrest um, and having been demoted by what was called the, I don't, can't remember, the free church or the, the church that uh, the communists set up in opposition to the Orthodox Church in America. They declared him to be a um, layman, though the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia and many, 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 many thousands of believers did not accept that demotion to a layperson that he was demoted to. And the Orthodox Church in the Ruslands in the Soviet Union, that which was under the control of the communists, in spite of all the efforts that the communists did to wipe it out, flourished, flourished and grew during that time. Here in Canada, though, we really suffered because our church was still a very small church with teeny tiny locations across the country. And one source that I had read indicated that we lost over 100 priests out of the church in Canada because the churches could not afford to look after them and their families and they moved to the States where the grass was greener. And so by 1970, when we received autocephaly, the Orthodox Church in America, in Canada, the Archdiocese, really only had five viable, alive parishes that were being able to flourish. And they were all, well, almost all of them were hanging in there and trying to look after the rural parishes that were suffering because of the lack of pastoral care. And then parishes such as St. Peter's, Holy Re Resurrection First, um, and Cal uh, Edmonton and um, Montreal started doing services in English, reaching out to all the people that the church had not been able to reach out to beforehand. And St. Peter is one of the fruits of the beginnings of the reach, outreach to all Canadians. I'm not saying English is the language people need to worship in in church, but in whichever church you worship in, or at least call your home, I pray that you understand the language of the services and of the scriptures because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if I tell you to go down to a bank on the corner of 6th and 12th, because I've made out a check for you for $100,000 and I speak to you in a language you do not understand or in tongues without interpretation, you're not gonna go do a thing about it. You would need to understand that I said, I've got this check waiting for you in your name. 
before you would do anything about it. And it's faithfulness on behalf of people like this that leads to people like Father Sebastian and I, to the deacons that we've got, to the lay people, the, those who have been made kings, priests, and prophets. It is res their responsibility. It is because of what they've done that we have what we have. And last night in the Vesper service, we sang several traparia to uh, St. James, because it's also the feast day for St. James, and also to St. Tikon. And the first one for Tikon goes, let us praise Tikon, patriarch of Russia and enlightener of North America, an ardent, ardent follower of the apostolic teachings and good pastor of the Church of Christ. He was elected by divine providence and laid down his life for his sheep. Let us sing to him with faith and hope and ask for his hierarchical intercessions. Keep the Church of Russia, and I would say Ukraine, in tranquility, both those churches, and the Church of North America in peace. May the Church in North America be at peace. Gather her scattered children into one flock. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And let us pray that the canonical, heretical, disunity that exists in North America come to an end and that somehow between all of those that are gathered here, one church will come to be that will be able to embrace and receive people from all the uh, children that are the result of Babel and the dispersion of the languages so nobody could understand each other. May they be gathered into one flock so that in spite of language and ethnic differences, they can each and every one of them call themselves Christian. Christos. Orthodox, yes, but Christian. And if you want to throw an uh, ethnic definition to who you are as a person, put that after Christian. Put it after Orthodox. Don't put it in front, as we have this terrible tendency to do. Bring to repentance, change of thinking to those who have renounced the true faith, preserve our lands from civil strife, and entreat God's peace for all people. This is not just a recent prayer. This is not a recent par. This goes back to 1989, or perhaps to the time when the Rokor did it at the beginning of the 1980s. Let us pray this prayer and let us especially in these days, ask St. Tikon to intercede for us. Intercede for your people, for we are in danger. A house divided against itself cannot stand. A house divided against itself will fall. This is the Lord's words. We must strive so hard towards unity. As we were discussing in the side room earlier today, Somebody's gonna to have to be able to say, forgive me. Well, yes, perhaps. But on the other side, somebody has to be willing to say, I forgive, even before anybody says, forgive me. We keep insisting, I won't forgive them until they ask forgiveness. You miss the point. Jesus did not wait till he said, forgive me, to die on the cross. He said, I, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And pray, Father, that they will receive that forgiveness and be willing to say, forgive me too. We get it backwards. That's pride and arrogance that says, I need to be asked forgiveness before I need to forgive. That is the devil. That is the devil's work and the devil's advocate, a, 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 approach to things. We can't do that. We can't do that. We're not in God's kingdom if we do. Forgive us our transgressions. Translation properly says, and I've said it, and I'll say it again and again and again, as we have already forgiven those who have transgressed against us. It doesn't work for us to wait for people to ask forgiveness. It will not happen. 
do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And we want people to forgive us before we even realize we've screwed up. Before we even realize our sin. A gentle manner adorned you, O Tikon. You showed kindness and compassion to those who repented, who changed their thinking. You were firm and unbending in confessing the Orthodox faith and zealous in loving God, the Lord. Holy Hierarch of Christ and Confessor Tikon, pray for us that we may not be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The question was asked at catechism the other night. When it speaks about approaching the Lord with fear and trembling, doesn't that mean awe and reverence? Yes, it does. And yes, it also means with fear and trembling. Fear, why? Well, let's look very briefly at the story, the parable, perhaps the reality of Lazarus and the rich man, where the rich man is saying, send Lazarus to give me a drink of water because I'm thirsty in this hot and horrible place. And Abraham says to him, can't be done. There's this big gap, this big chasm between the two of us. And no one can come from you to us, nor the other way around. And the question arises, where did that chasm come from? Who made that chasm? God does not make that chasm. Jesus does not make that chasm. He, in fact, builds a bridge, even if there is a chasm, and goes from one side to the other and invites people to cross back. Know my brothers and sister, sisters in Christ, the chasm is made by the one who refuses to receive love and, who receive, and refuses to give love. From the one who refuses to forgive and refuses to ask forgiveness. They make the chasm. No one can come between us. Oh, but you know what? You can fill in the chasm. You can fill in the chasm and make it possible for people to reach you and for you to reach them. It's love, it's forgiveness. And in the gospel today, that's one of the most amazing things that is being revealed. This is one of three people that the scriptures refer to that Jesus raises from the dead. The easiest job, <laughs> was the raising of Lazarus' daughter from the dead. She hadn't even been taken out of her bed yet. She was still in her bed. And he comes weeping and he finds his wife, Jairus finds his wife weeping. They laugh at Jesus when they say she's just sleeping. Get out everybody, just Jairus, his wife, me and my disciples will be here. And he tells her to wait, to get up. Actually the Greek says, be resurrected, be risen. And she, he raises her. And he relieves the pain and suffering of those who could not see. The state that people really are in when they fall asleep. This one's a little more complicated. The sun is already in a coffin. It says it's open so you can see who it is. And Jesus comes. It's one of those looks like a coincidental thing. Doesn't know this woman, has nothing, she has nothing to do with the Orthodox faith, i.e. the Jewish faith. She's a foreigner, not part of God's people. She's a widow already, and now she's lost her only living son. Was he little and having to be looked after? Or was she fortunate because he was old enough to be earning an income and look after his mother who was a widow who had no other sustenance, no other source of income than the male earner of income in the family? If younger, she lost something precious. If older, she lost something precious and also the source of her life. It reminds us of the prayer we pray every day Grant me to greet the coming day in peace. Help me in all things to rely upon your holy will and in every hour of the day reveal your will to me. And 
the Father's will and Jesus' will was this woman needs compassion. She needs someone to support her and I'm there for her. And I can see what's going on in the unseen realm that she can't and that her son has not perished. But I'm gonna wake him up for his sake, for her sake, and to give people some little hint towards the fact that there is a general resurrection and everyone shall be raised because if there is not a general resurrection, Christ is not risen either. And so they are given some assurance that there is a presence that shows what God has prophesied and promised. They don't see him, of course, as the Lord and King and God, but as a prophet. But on one level, this is a prophecy for the people, prophesying to them what's going to happen. And then, of course, there's the other one, when he raises Lazarus from the dead, who's been in the tomb for three days and stinks already. And everybody again is weeping. It's an interesting thing because women play a huge role in every single one of these. They have done the intercession. And I have to tell you that the prayers of women are one of the most vital things that are required. And I encounter a lot of the services when, if you take the men out of the uh, clergy at the service, there are no men or almost no men present. Of course, they have an excuse they're working. I'm not judging you, but there are women there. They've come to lift up their needs to the Lord, to intercede for others and to pray for them. Jesus is compassionate. And in each and every one of our lives, we are experiencing, if not physical death for ourselves or for our friends and family, and struggling and suffering with that, we are certainly in various ways being attacked by spiritual death and suffering worth and trying to overcome the effects of sin that try to ensnare us. I remember preaching at St. Peter's once when I was not here, I was serving somewhere else and speaking about how Jesus, who goes to the land of the dead, goes, for instance, to your depression, which is a place of being in the land of the dead, and says, I am with you. And whether or not that gives you immediate relief and takes you out, at least it gives you an assurance that the loving, compassionate one who enters into and walks with us in every aspect of our lives is with you. And whether things are going well or going tough. Oh, in the uh, last prayer that I prayed today as part of the uh, uh, prayers at Matins, illumine us, help us to see help us to grasp onto and recognize that which we do not see. And when we strive to be faithful, when we try to have faith, let us remember that it is not only saying, I believe, Lord, but faithfulness means, oh, and this is what was in the prayer was, you have taken us out of the darkness of the night and have given us the light of the morning. And in the darkness, he is working at illumining us, body, soul, and spirit, so that we be enlightened. And we have many people in our church right now that are getting ready to be baptized, baptized and chrismated, baptized and chrismated or chrismated, who are saying, I want that illumination. I want to be enlightened with the enlightenment of Christ and I pray that having been enlightened that that illumination grows in us that we see with greater and greater clarity all that Christ and his Father and the Holy Spirit are doing on our behalf and on behalf of all the world Christ is in the midst